Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Any questions? Questions? Okay, so then I, I have uh, some questions uh, before I get to a small demonstration and then a uh, few more examples with the BIOS of our law. Uh, so uh, here is the one. Uh, the figure shows three currents. Let me just reduce a little the volume. The figure shows three currents, I1, I2, I3 of equal magnitude, I on the three vertices of, of an equilateral triangle. I hope you can see the question. Um, currents I1, I2 flow out of the page. As we said, these uh, dots, uh, you can imagine that uh, you have an arrow like this. Okay? So when you see it from the front, that is the arrow comes towards you, you see a dot. So the dot represents the arrow coming towards you. And then if the arrow goes into the page, you see an X. So the arrow just pierces the page and leaves an, edge, uh, an X behind. So you will see this notation a lot in magnetism. This means that the current comes out of the board. This means that the current goes into the board. You can think of it as this uh, arrow. Um, so what is the direction of the total force on I3 due to the other two currents? That is uh, the question here. And this comes back to this fundamental observable of magnetism, which, mean, which is that if you have co-directional currents, those co-directional currents attract, contra-directional currents repel. Think about the magnetic levitation trains where you have underneath the train and the tracks contra-directional currents and then the train levitates as a result. Um, so here we have, we are asked to find the total force on I3. I3 and I1 are contradirectional, so therefore there will be a force. We calculated that force. We did it on Monday, we did it again on uh, Wednesday. Uh, that uh, the force will be along the line that connects the wires and pointing outwards. So it will be a force like this. And then there will be one more force from the other current, like this. And you see that because we're being told that these currents are all equal magnitude, the triangle is equilateral, so therefore these two forces will be equal in magnitude, and that means that if you consider their projection along the horizontal line, those two components will cancel each other out, and if you add vectorially those two forces, uh, there will be a total force that points upwards. So this is sort of a conceptual question on the forces. Uh, on Wednesday, we showed another exam example of the force of a magnetic field on a moving electron. So here, we're being told, on a moving charge, sorry, we're being told that a charged particle is moving in a uniform magnetic field of field intensity B that points into the paper. So again, here you see this notation that means the magnetic flux density is into the board. Uh, the force, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the particle moves downwards, so this is the velocity v, and uh, it receives a force uh, f that uh, points to the right. The question is indicate whether the particle is positive, negative, or neutral, and provide a brief explanation. Any, question, any uh, ideas on this? So the force, uh, as we uh, showed, is QV cross B. Uh, this plays the role of IDL that we saw in the bios our law. Uh, so if this is positive, if the charge is positive, then you will have a force that uh, points the direction of this cross product V cross B. So if Q is positive, F will be parallel to V cross B. If Q is negative, F will be anti-parallel to V cross B. So all we have to check here is whether it is parallel or anti-parallel to V cross B. And V cross B is the cross product, uh, you see, between the uh, velocity, the field that goes inwards. So V cross B points to the right. V cross B points to the right. is the cross product between the velocity that goes downwards, the magnetic flux that goes inwards, 
and therefore uh, the V cross B goes to the right. So V cross B is parallel to the force, and therefore that means that uh, the charge will have to be positive. Okay, so this is a small um, conceptual question. So you can have now the coexistence of electric and magnetic forces. So uh, this is something uh, I can uh, use uh, the uh, tablet uh, and I will go to the board back uh, in a little bit. Um, this uh, interaction between electric and magnetic fields is used in a sensor that is all over the place. It is the whole effect sensor. Uh, there are many applications here I have, uh, and I'm not intending to advertise, there are many companies that produce these uh, little sensors that sense magnetic field and are being used to check, for example, in airplanes, whether you have shut the door, whether doors are shut in, in, in airplanes, whether doors are shut in printers. When you uh, close the printer, uh, you have a whole sensor there to uh, find whether uh, the, the door is closed. Uh, how does this uh, work? So this senses magnetic field. That is uh, the idea. It is a piece of a semiconductor like this. So it is a P-doped semiconductor. That's uh, how we would call this, which means that the main carriers of charge in this piece of semiconductor are holes. So you have positive charges that are moving. We bias this semiconductor with a voltage source like this. So therefore, those holes inside the semiconductor will be moving from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. They will uh, face now an electric force that uh, makes them move from uh, left to right. So, that, so you get a current started there. You get a current started. So if a magnetic field comes in, let's say, just like in our previous example, comes into the board, so you bring in a magnet, or a door closes towards the sensor, and on that door you have attached a magnet like this, a bar magnet. Okay? So then that brings in a magnetic field like this. Okay? So then what happens? This charge will receive the force, just like the force we saw before, that will push it upwards. And as a result, the sensor moves to a new state, where now those charges are being pushed this way. And obviously, negative charges will be pushed this way, or because of the uh, presence of these excess positive charges on the top, there will be excess negative charges on the bottom. And what do you have there? It is now a formation, effectively, of another field inside the sensor that points from the positive charges to the negative charges. So now, those uh, holes that are coming towards the right that are being pushed by the voltage source. The voltage source is still there. The voltage source is still there. They will be receiving two forces. One force from this secondary electric field that has been generated. You see, they will be pushed towards the negative charges to the bottom. So this effect has created inside the sensor sort of a new capacitor, a secondary capacitor a virtual capacitor. So you have positive charges on the top, negative charges on the bottom, secondary field inside. There's an electric field here inside E. And of course, there exists the force from the magnetic field. So we have a force from the electric field, which is Q times the electric field, uh, and a force from magnetic field that is QVB. And this phenomenon reaches equilibrium when those two forces exactly cancel each other out. So when exactly the forces cancel each other out, then now the current that flows in the semiconductor just goes straight through and doesn't experience any force uh, in the vertical direction anymore. So at equilibrium, 
those two forces cancel each other out. You have QE equals QVB, which means that your electric field there is proportional to the magnetic flux density. So we have a quantity like the electric field, which we can measure. How can we measure the electric field? Any ideas? So here the Honeywell spec has these three terminals. Uh, this is the output, so you see they are measuring a voltage. So what voltage is this? Any ideas? If I go back to my diagram. How can I measure this electric field? So this is the other terminal that... Uh, this is the terminal where we are sensing this voltage. We call this whole voltage. This is the whole effect. So when I measure this whole voltage is basically electric field times the height of the sensor. So this is E times H. So the voltage that we are measuring is E times the height of the sensor, which is V times B times H. So you see this is a sensor that basically senses magnetic the presence of a magnetic field. So if you are using this sensor to check whether a door is closed, all you need to do is attach a magnet to the door. The door comes in, the sensor is here. Then when the voltage exceeds the voltage that you are expecting from this formula for the magnetic field of your magnet, then you are sensing basically you need just a logic circuit that does a comparison and tells you that indeed your voltage has exceeded the voltage you expect and the door is closed. Very simple principle, and uh, it's been used very, very, very widely in many applications. So um, the other thing I wanted to show is uh, a small demonstration here. I have uh, a bunch of, um, and let me see if I can uh, use my camera to show you exactly what I have here. Uh, so it is uh, basically a stack of magnetic dipoles of uh, circular loops. Uh, and uh, I have connected them to a voltage source and I have a magnet next to it. So the magnet right now points uh, north. But if I turn on the, uh, the source... Uh, apparently, the, the let, sorry, it seems that uh, this socket doesn't work. Okay. Let me just try again to see if I can get a current here. No, so this will go down as a failed demonstration because I don't have power in uh, this socket and then I cannot turn on the source. Let me try uh, this one just in case it can work very quickly otherwise I will abort the experiment. I think I have used this before and I don't have very long cables either so be very careful here. Okay, let me see if I can get voltage out. Okay, I can get it actually. So, all right, let me just try once more. Um, I, I may need someone's help with the camera if uh, anybody can actually hold the camera. Ah, you can do that? Okay, great. So that's where we need the camera and maybe uh, nothing works here. So we need to approach the magnet. Put the magnet here. Okay, so right now I hope you see the magnet points there, so 
I'm pushing the wrong button. Oh, yeah, okay. So you see the magnet is affected and measuring the magnetic field of the, um, of the coil. So if I turn it off, hopefully it recedes. Turn it on, just increase a little bit the current. So the compass needle is moving just a little bit, but it does move. So the, okay, so I think I'll stop it here. So this is a small uh, demonstration uh, of uh, magnetic field that you can produce without a bar magnet. Of course, uh, a, an easier uh, demonstration is this one, where actually I do have a bar magnet and a set of magnets underneath. And what you see there, right here, is the orientation of the magnets underneath along the magnetic field. So you see as I move the magnets, as I move the bar magnet, the small magnets underneath move along the magnetic field lines. Okay. And of course you can put a, a second magnet and uh, now the one thing that uh, you can see is that the magnets in front do move, but the magnets behind do not move. So the one magnet actually shields this area from the presence of the other magnet. Another effect uh, that is interesting and can be shown in this uh, setup. So I hope that you can see it. So the magnetic field lines that are forming around the magnet. So no magnet, and then as the magnet comes in, you see the other small magnets are moving along the magnetic field lines that are being generated. Okay, so this is uh, the small demonstration. Uh, not as effective as I would hope, but um, now I will move uh, to the board and um, get back to an example uh, for the Biosavar law. Uh, so the So remember that uh, the Biot-Savart law basically tells us the magnetic flux density of an elementary current. So it tells us that if you have a current ideal at a position vector r prime and dl prime, let's say and you want to find the magnetic flux density at an observation point with position vector r, then the formula is db equals to mu naught by 4 pi i dl prime r minus r prime divided by r minus r prime cubed. And I do hope that you have followed the examples that we did before and uh, the one that we will do now because in your textbook the presentation is a little, a little bit confusing. So I've noticed that um, the presentation is somewhat confusing. So that's my goal uh, here of uh, taking this step by step is actually to uh, clear this confusion that one can see if they directly go and uh, check the book and try to figure out what happens. So in electricity, you remember that we had seen uh, surface charges. It's a very simple concept. You have a surface like the surface of a capacitor, the uh, plate of a capacitor, and you charge it with a voltage source. Very uh, simple concept. 
We have a, an analogous concept in magnetism with surface currents, and I'll try to explain what a surface current uh, means. And then uh, give you an example of magnetic field. So what are these? You see, if you take a PCB like this, the current flows on a conductor. This conductor has a volume, but the height is very small. As you can see, you cannot even see the height. Uh, it's just too small that effectively the current flows on the printed circuit board, right? So this is the kind of thing that we would call surface current. So if you start from a rectangular conductor like this, that has a width W and height H. And let's say there is current flow through the conductor with constant current density, J, so volume current density, So you remember this concept of the current density, the volume current density. To get the current, you multiply the current density with a cross-section, or you integrate over the cross-section. So now that I have a current density J in amps per meter squared that flows through the rectangular cross-section, the total current is the current density J times the cross-section, which is H times W, correct? And you, you remember this concept of the current density, volume current density. It's amps per meter squared. So still, it's not amps per meter cubed. It's volume current density in the sense that the current flows within a volume. But then if you want to find the current from the current density, you multiply or you integrate over the cross-section of the conductor. Just like the idea that if you have an extension cord, you are not increasing the current. The current flows through the... Uh, for, through the cross-section. Now imagine that you are talking about a conductor like the conductor of a PCB, which means that the height of the conductor goes to zero. So what happens when H goes to zero? You have a situation like this. So when H goes to zero and the current remains finite because you are still feeding the conductor with the source, necessarily what would happen to this current density, the volume current density? So if this goes to zero, if I remains the same, so I'm finite, W is what you see there. What happens to J, to the current density? It has to go to infinity. It has to go to infinity. Whenever a physical quantity goes to infinity, that means that it has lost its physical meaning. And in this case, the loss of physical meaning comes from the fact that now you don't have a volume here. The height of this is so small that you cannot see this anymore as a volume. The current effectively flows on the surface. So that is why we now go and take this finite quantity, J times H, and we define it as a surface current density J sub S. And the unit is amps per meter. So you see surface charge is in coulomb per meter squared. This one is in coulombs per meter, in, sorry, in amps per meter. So when you have a conductor like this, where the current flows like that, and you are being told that there is a current density, surface current density Js on the conductor, if uh, this height, let's say, is H, then basically the current that is flowing through is Js times H. 
And if, uh, the, uh, if the distribution is not uniform, then you need to integrate it along the, um, this cross section. So you see here, uh, uh, sorry, let me call this W because it's a uh, width. So you see it from here that once now I define J sub S, I just need to multiply this with the width of the conductor to get the total current. So that's why this is amps per meter. You multiply by meters and you get amps. So now I uh, define the problem that I want to solve, the example. Uh, magnetic flux density of an infinite plane with a current density, constant current density y hat. So I am on the xy plane and this is the magnetic analog of the uh, charged surface that we had seen. So we are on the xy plane and we have a current that flows this way. And we're being asked to find B at any arbitrary point, either above or underneath the plane. So this is the magnetic analog, if you wish, of the uh, charged plane that we had seen in um, electricity. So just to see it on a cross-sectional view, if you are uh, looking at this on the YZ uh, plane, we have here right on this plane the current that is flowing, and then we are trying to observe or uh, find the magnetic flux density above and below the plane. So how do we solve this? Again, I'm referring to the Biosavar law, so therefore I have to identify the IDL that will play, uh, what will play in this example, the role of IDL in the Biosavar. Okay. Uh, so step one, as always, is decide on the coordinates, which coordinates to use. So here we have a rectangular geometry, therefore I will use Cartesian coordinates. Uh, there is no other symmetry there. Second step is find IDL. That is, imagine the source is broken down to uh, elementary currents. So now this one is not a wire, it is a surface. Therefore, Since my current is distributed on a surface, I will go and uh, define a differential surface element, ds, on this plane where the current flows. So I'm taking this one. So this is uh, dy primed. This is dx primed. And the coordinates of the point in the middle of the surface are x prime, y prime, z equal to zero. So the corresponding position vector will be x prime, x hat plus y prime, y hat. So now through my surface, I see a current that is produced by this surface current density. 
How much current do I have there? So how much current do I have there? You see, I have this uh, small, let me enlarge it, current flow. This is dx prime. This is dy prime. So when you have a current density, you want to go from the current density to the current. You multiply the current density with the front through the current flows. So you need to imagine a line that cuts the current like this and multiply it by the line. So this is what I call the X prime here. So the current that flows right inside this surface the current that I have right there is JS not DX prime. Just look at this uh, idea here and its correspondence with what we do in this example. And so I is GS not DX prime. That is my I. And what is DL prime? DL prime is a vector along the path of the current in the direction of the current. The current flows in the y direction. Look at this. So my DL is nothing else but this. So this DL prime is dy prime y hat. At the end of the day, this ideal prime has to point in the direction of the current. So this is the ideal prime. So any questions on this? Anybody wants me to re-explain it? So you see I do this step by step and there is no need for any uh, acrobatic logic there. Uh, you, once you realize what is the surface current density, uh, then you say, OK, I have a surface current density here. I take the differential surface area, the ds, and then I'm looking at the situation. How much is the current and which direction does it flow? And from that, I have the IDL that I need to plug into the Biosavar law. Yes? Because this is DL. If you remember, with the Biosavar law is talking about wires along a length DL. So DL is not just the direction, it's also the length uh, that you are considering. So here the length of this flow is this, D, uh, this dy prime. At the end of the day, also I have to have the right units if you want to uh, game the answer to this question. The units here have to be amps times meter. So I have amps per meter times meter squared. So I have the right units here, amps times meter. So I need that dy. OK, so I have this. So step three is apply the Biosavar law. Prime cubed. Uh, I'm being told to find the magnetic field at an arbitrary observation point. So this R will be xx hat plus yy hat plus zz hat. Therefore, R minus R primed will be x minus x primed, y minus y prime and z, z hat. In fact, uh, if you go back to your notes on the surface charge plane, they will be very, very similar. Uh, the length of this vector is z squared. And uh, I have to calculate this cross product that is uh, something that remains to be done. Ideal, I will put what I just found, which is uh, JS naught 
dx prime dy prime y hat. I don't need to prime Cartesian vectors because they are the unit vectors that remain constant throughout space. And now I get the cross product with r minus r prime, which is z, z hat. Okay. So I do this cross product uh, step by step. Uh, first of all, y cross y will give me 0. So that is the one that I don't need. y cross x will give me minus z hat. y cross uh, z will give me plus z hat. Okay, and y cross y gives me zero. So I have those two terms. And uh, now I'm ready to put the entire expression together, mu naught by 4 pi, j s naught dx prime, dy prime, I have the z squared, 3 halves, I have 1 half from the square root and 3 from uh, the bios of our law. And I have here the vectors plus z x hat. In fact, we had seen exactly this or the same integrals as you will see now, the integrals uh, in the charged plane. So any questions up to this point? So I'm ready now for the last step. And uh, the last step is to integrate. So I integrate over the entire distribution. So B will be the integral. I'm taking out of the integral the constants. And inside I have these two terms. The first is in the z hat. Uh, my plane is infinite, so I, integ I integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. The y prime. Okay, and then the next one will be uh, z x hat dy prime, same thing underneath. Any questions up to this point? So now I have those two integrals. This integral, you see, divides a node function of x minus x prime with an even function of x minus x prime, which is x minus x prime squared. Integrated over a symmetric interval will give you 0. And this one is an integral that we have seen before. And its result is 2 divided by z squared. 2 divided by z squared. So then uh, the final result is that you have an x hat magnetic field. Uh, sorry, with a pi, 2 pi over z squared. Mu naught, j s naught, uh, sorry, not z squared, z. Okay, z, in fact, uh, absolute value. 2 pi over absolute value of z. Sorry about that. 
So 2 pi over absolute value of z. So finally, the result is that we have a magnetic field that is x hat mu naught js naught by 2. You see it's in the x direction. z over z uh, absolute value gives you 1 when z is positive minus 1 when z is negative. So we have a plus 1 here. Uh, the pi and this pi cancel out. So that's how the uh, pi uh, goes away. And this holds for z greater than 0. And it is x nu naught js naught over 2 minus 1 when z is less than 0. So to go back to my um, uh, two-dimensional picture, If I have here the y and the z, the x-axis comes out of the board. The current flows this way. Along the y direction. And we see on the top the magnetic flux coming out of the board. Being an x-hat magnetic flux. So this is how it looks like. When you are at the positive z half plane. And when you are underneath, it is minus x, so it comes into the board. Okay. So that's how this looks like on the yz plane. And uh, if you want to see it on the xz plane, x, y, z, in that case the y axis comes into the board, x, y, z, the y axis comes into the board. So in this case you see the current that goes into the board. So in this uh, diagram now these x's represent the current. The current density. And we have the uh, magnetic field, the magnetic uh, flux lines that go this way above, the, uh, above z equals 0 for positive z's, and they go this way below. So this is uh, B. So this is J, this is B. In this case, this is the current, J, and this is B. So these are the two cuts that can help you understand how the field lines look like. Uh, any uh, questions? First of all, we see that the magnetic field is constant throughout. That is reminiscent of what we had seen with the electric field of a charge plane, which was constant throughout. This is a side effect of the assumption that uh, the current is infinite. Obviously, if the current was finite, then the magnetic field would decay away from the current. Uh, the other thing that you know is that on Monday we said Gauss's law for magnetism. Magnetic field lines are always closed. They always have to be closed. Well, here they close at infinity. They are infinite lines and they are closing at infinity, if this was a finite plane, if this was a finite plane, then the magnetic field lines would actually be like this. And that brings me back to something I mentioned before about what is the engineering meaning of this approximation that we have an infinite surface current. It simply means that we are very far from the edges. So indeed, if you are sitting here very far from the edges of the conductor, off or if you want to find the magnetic field of a PCB like this, and you are very far from the edges of the conductor, then you are basically seeing a uniform field and straight field lines. So you see, if you are here, an observer right here, and you are looking at the field lines, you see them passing above you like this. 
So if you are far away, you are seeing this uniform picture. So that is what we mean by uh, infinite conductor. Last piece of intuition on this, um, or two more things uh, about this. Um, first of all, would you expect the magnetic field, before the calculation, would you expect the magnetic field to depend on x or y? So how many would expect an xy dependence of the magnetic field? Because we did some extra work on x and y, right? Yes? So the answer is no, because the plane is infinite. So if you imagine a drone that flies over the plane, changes x and y coordinates, doesn't see any change in the distribution underneath. So the magnetic field, to begin with, could only depend on z. I'm not saying which way to point. I'm saying which variables would it depend upon. So you would not expect to have any xy dependence here, because if you imagine an observer who changes their x or y coordinates above the plane, they see an infinite plane underneath. And therefore, they shouldn't be seeing any difference in the effect that this plane uh, creates. Second uh, and last thing I wanted to say about this example, if you look at this view of the plane, so the, the current flows into the board, okay? Uh, or the three-dimensional view like this, that the current flows like this. It is as if you have assembled this current distribution with infinite many wires that you stacked up wires, wire, 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 and then you created this surface charge density. Right? I can see this as a superposition of wires, that these are just wires that go into the board. But we have found the magnetic field of a wire. The magnetic field of a wire circulates around the wire. So if this is the current I, the magnetic flux circulates around it. If the current goes into the board like this, the magnetic flux circulates this way. So now, on this plane, if you imagine that this current has been created by wires that go into the board, each one of them would create a magnetic field, just like this diagram, like this, like this. So you see by this insight into what magnetic field to expect, if you see this distribution as being created by a stack of, of wires next to each other, then you see each one of them would create these magnetic flux lines. So when you superimpose all of them, their envelope gives you this nice straight line going to the left on the top Going, sorry, going to the right on the top, going to the left at the bottom, that we see in our calculation. So in fact, we could have, by this argument, right away guessed also the direction of the magnetic flux in those two, on those two half spaces. So these are um, my notes for uh, this particular example. The last thing I want to say, is that usually you get uh, these planar conductors in a closed circuit. So you have uh, one set of currents that goes to the right and one set of currents that goes to the left. In other words, you can take the capacitor that we saw in electrostatics, connect it to a closed circuit, and there will be also currents, not just charges, but currents on those two conductors. Well. If you look at the magnetic field that this current would produce, that would be something like this.
And if you look at the magnetic field that the opposite current would produce, so the opposite uh, charge, that would be something like this. Okay. So if you combine the two together, if you combine the two together, and you have a capacitor that supports currents now, inside you will have non-zero field, and outside will have zero field. So pretty much like what we saw in electrostatics. And the magnetic field inside here would be 2 times the mu naught j s naught over 2, so it will be mu naught j s naught. Pretty much like what we saw in the capacitor. We'll get back to this uh, case when we go to Ampere's law. I'll stop here. We'll stick around if there are any questions. Otherwise, we'll see you on uh, Monday. Thank you.